Hi, hey, everybody. Thank you. Welcome to the webinar today. Uh, behind the desk of a commercial and SBA lender, what to know when your business needs capital, presented by Mike Mickler of Pineland Bank. Thank you for joining us and thank you for participating in our icebreaker poll. Uh, I am Allie Stevens with the Florida SBDC at UNF. In case you are unfamiliar with us, we are part of a statewide network and our mission is to help your businesses start, grow and succeed. Uh, we do this by offering training and webinars like this one today, but also by providing no cost confidential consulting in all aspects of business management and growth, um, like business plan review, marketing strategy, financial analysis, and a, a whole gambit more. Um, we offer, um, we are now offering consulting during non-business hours, so early in the morning, later in the evening, and on weekends um, as another value add to further assist our small business um, clients. So all of our contact information will be in the chat box and in the follow-up email that will be sent to all attendees um, after the close of the webinar. So if you're interested in following up with us to either get more training um, or make an appointment, a no-cost appointment with us, you will be able to do so. Um, quick, quick housekeeping, this session is being recorded and the link will be sent out to everybody in that email I just mentioned. Um, <clears throat> and also there's going to be a survey sent out. Um, if you could let us know your thoughts on the topic, the speaker, the, the, the other topics we are offering, we use this feedback um, to continue to grow our training offerings to better suit you. Um, and also one more thing to mention, if you have any questions throughout the presentation today, there is a question section on your control panel. If you just open that and type your question into it, um, we'll, we'll get to them throughout the presentation and, and there's time for Q&A at the end. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Jody Henson, um, an assistant director and consultant uh, for the SBDC out in our Nassau County op uh, office. So Jody, take it away. Thank you, Allie, I appreciate that. Um, yes, I am coming to you from Nassau County, which many of you know is exploding with growth. So our topic today is just very, very timely. And I'm thrilled to death to have Mike Meichler here today to be our speaker and take you through a view of what lenders are looking at and thinking about when you go to them and ask to get a business loan. So the whole purpose today is to kind of up your game so you can find more success if you do feel that you need to get a, um, an SBA, SBA loan or a commercial loan. And the good news is really great lenders like Mike will sit down and figure out which type of loan is best for you. But let me tell you a little bit about our speaker. So Mike is a native Jacksonville resident, born and raised here, and he has um, in a 10th generation of his family, including at, at Michler's Beach. So I'm gonna just mention this. Everyone always thinks the last name is Mickler, but it's actually pronounced Michler. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's a common mistake, I know. Um, but Mike moved back to Nassau County way back in 1990, and he has been doing commercial lending for 30 years. And so this guy has seen it all and he has helped just about anybody in any type of business. So that's why we're so excited to have him here today because he brings a wealth of knowledge and ways to help small businesses, which is all about what, what our mission is. So he's been doing this, like I said, for over 30 years. He does both SBA and commercial lending. He is kind of known as the money coach because Mike takes his, his job a little bit further rather than just looking at a loan application. He really likes to sit down and build relationships with his clients and get to know them and absolutely get to know and understand their business. And that enables him to help them even more. So he was just the perfect guy to help give us that peek behind the curtain of what a lender looks for. Mike is married and he has three children. He loves to travel, he loves history. He's very into creating driftwood, artwork. It's really cool, I've seen some of it before. And he loves to do shark teeth art, just as a few fun facts. But more importantly, he's got some great information to share with us today. So Mike, I'm gonna hand it over to you and thank you so much, take it away. All right, thank you so much, Jody, for that warm introduction. Thank you, Allie, for ha having me today. And 
hosting. I just want to thank everybody who's on the line with us today. Thank you for spending some time with us today, learning a little bit more about uh, the lending world from, from my perspective, which I really believe will help you in your goal, uh, whether it's today or down the road, uh, to seek funding. Uh, and I'm going to talk broad. I'm not going to talk specifically about uh, my lending institution. I have worked in my career for small community banks, uh, credit unions, large national banks. Uh, so I've kind of uh, worked from every side of uh, the lending aspect from, a, from a, a lending aspect. And I hope that'll help you. So today we're going to talk about some of the tools that I use to evaluate risk for the bank various loan options for entrepreneurs starting, growing, or buying a business. And finally, we're going to cover what we consider and what you should consider when shopping for a loan. Okay, so that's the broad brushstroke of what we're going to be covering. And we'll go ahead and slide right into the first uh, piece, which are really the tools, the tools that bankers use to evaluate risk. And I really invite you guys to go ahead and type those questions in as they come up. Uh, Allie and Jody will go ahead and fire those questions off. I'd really like this to be interactive. So don't wait till the end to ask your questions as they come up. Just type them into the chat bar, the question box, and we'll get those answered for you. Okay. So my job and all bankers is really to understand my client's needs, to evaluate and mitigate the risk for the bank based on our experience. I'll say that again. My job as a lender is to understand my client's needs, evaluate and mitigate the risk for the bank based on our experience. And we have tools that'll help us uh, toward that end. And this is kind of lending 101. Uh, we call that the five C's of credit. And I'll go into these from my perspective. Um, the character is, is really one of the first requirements, okay? And the reason it's really called character and not credit is because before there was a credit bureau, we based our loan decisions based on the character of that person. You, you may have heard the expression, a handshake loan, or we shook on it, or I know his family, and they'll be good for this debt. Remember, there was a time in banking and lending where there no, were no credit bureaus. There was no concise uh, synopsis of how this person paid their bills. So we really had to do it based on the character of that person. So that's where that C comes from. But it's really about, these days, it's about the credit history. And <clears throat> I'm gonna sprinkle some pro tips throughout this presentation. You can take notes, but I'm going to give you, the, for those who want the pro tips, it's on one sheet of paper. You can ask Allie or Jody to give those to you. Just put a note in the chat bar, the questions bar, say, I'd like the pro tips. But I'm going to sprinkle some of those pro tips, and these are going to be really helpful to you as you plan on borrowing and at what degree you're going to borrow. So, so Mike, oh, sorry to interrupt. Um, a quick question, though. Do Speaking of credit score and credit history, do SBA and commercial loans have minimum credit scores to qualify? Uh, that's a great question, Allie. <clears throat> um, most of you have probably applied for car loans, if not residential mortgages. And so we are very familiar as consumers about our FICO score, our credit score, uh, as it relates to cars or homes. And there are minimum credit scores for those uh, types of loans. The good news is that with most lending institutions, including ours, we do not have set minimum score requirements for commercial or SBA loans. And that's, that's really a departure from what I think us as consumers are used to. Not that it's important, not that it's not important to have the highest credit score possible and to have good credit history, but there's no minimum uh, credit score uh, with our institution and many, many others. Um, remember, there are three major bureaus, uh, Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion. Uh, those credit bureaus uh, basically collect uh, information, uh, payment history from your creditors, and we receive a score, okay? And believe it or not, this is one of the pro tips, 
your score the same day, if you've had, if you have applied for three different loans, an unsecured loan, a mortgage loan, or a car loan, if you applied on the same day, you would have three different scores. It's hard to believe, but that score is saying the predictive nature of this person repaying that debt is this, and they put out that number. So that's why it's important to know that um, if I if I have a, a, a credit score a monitoring service and it says I'm a 720, and your lender says, uh, I'm sorry you failed to meet our lending requirements, our cutoff score is 700, you shouldn't be surprised. Because again, the uh, based on the type of loan in which you're applying, that's going to drive your score. Okay, I'll say something else about character or credit history. Um, one of the things that I've seen over the years, and I've taught a lot about credit bureaus and how to get your credit higher and so forth, is I recommend to my clients have about three credit cards. Use one of them. Keep the other ones open so you have that availability, but use one uh, and try to pay that off at the end of each month. And I wouldn't use any more than about 30 to 50 percent of the maximum availability on that one card. So if I have three cards, all of them have a $10,000 line limit, let's just say, use one of those cards on a regular basis and have no more than three to $5,000 balance at any given time on that one card. That's going to give you a better score than it would if you used all three and you had higher utilization. Think about it like this. The credit bureaus say, oh my gosh, this guy doesn't need uh, his credit cards to live on. He only uses about 20 or 30 percent of his availability. He doesn't need that versus, oh my word, this person needs uh, credit to pay their monthly bills. So they're relying on so much more of their availability. It's one of the reasons why a lot of people's score is low is because of debt utilization, not because they're not paying bills on time. They're using revolving credit too much. Another quick pro tip regarding credit bureaus. Um, I don't subscribe to monitoring service. I simply freeze my credit. I, that's what I believe to do. That's the most effective way. I just freeze all three major bureaus. And when I'm ready to apply for credit, um, then I'll unfreeze them. You can subscribe to a, a credit monitoring service, but why not freeze it? Stop it at the source. Stop that, uh, that fraud at the source. So that's my recommendation with regard to credit. Okay, any questions you're seeing, Allie or Jody, on that? No, but the um, in that uh, debt ratio, um, I guess you did kind of cover how the bank evaluates the debt to income. But what about for a startup business? Not so personal, but for the startup business. Getting there next. That's a great okay. way. Thank you. So. Second uh, tool that we lenders use to evaluate credit is capacity. Um, what's this person's capacity to repay the debt? Um, think about driving in a car. If you have a full tank, you have the capacity to go 300 miles. Versus if you have a half of, of a tank, you don't have the same capacity. It's the same way with uh, the debt service coverage ratio, the debt to income ratio. This is simply a, a ratio, a measure of a person's income versus their debt, okay? So on the personal side for a car loan or a mortgage loan, it's gonna be debt to income, okay? And those standards are typically <clears throat> somewhere around 40% for mortgages, maybe a little bit higher. You want no more than 40 or 50% of your gross monthly income to be used for your mortgage or pay, uh, housing uh, payment, okay? On the commercial or SBA side, we're going to use the inverse. We're going to use the income, the global income of the business and the personal versus the combined debt of the business and the personal. So it's debt service coverage ratio, which is the inverse of debt to income ratio. So I mentioned a 40 to 50 percent uh, maximum for debt to income. That gives a person about a 50% 60% cushion, okay, versus what their income is for their for that expense. <clears throat> On the business side, 
the ratios are a little bit more lax, we allow just a 20 or 25% cushion. So if you're a, a business and most of the folks on the call, about 75% have an existing business and they're looking to grow, so they may be looking to, to borrow money, we're gonna look at your historical uh, tax returns and we're gonna see based on your debts and this new debt that you're considering, if you have about a 20 or 25% cushion. So let's say you make $10,000 a month income in your business and you have $10,000 a month of expenses. That's a one-to-one -one ratio. You're, you're breaking even. A for-profit, a non-for-profit business will break even. That's a one-to-one -one ratio. If you're a for-profit business, you'd like to be making about 12 to 12.5 a month and have no more than $10,000 a month of expenses. That's a 1.2 or 1.25 ratio. So you have a 20 or 25% cushion. That's what we're looking for uh, to approve your loan. And again, that's based on those tax returns. So that is the capacity. Now, <clears throat> um, now your question back to your question, Allie, was really how are we going to evaluate a startup? Because 20 or 25% of the group on this call is interesting as starting a business. You don't have those historical tax returns to show me, but we're going to be able to use projections. We're going to help with the help of uh, Jody, Marge, and some of the other small business development uh, counselors at SBDC. We're going to develop a business plan together with financial projections that's going to show a cash flow and it's going to have that anticipated revenue and expenses. And based on those projections, we can actually approve you for a loan for your startup business. That's why it's so important to work with a preferred SBA lender because we can take that risk, we can help you along and shepherd you in that process so that you're able to obtain credit even though you don't have historical tax returns. So that was a great question. Next, I'm gonna talk about capital. <clears throat> and really think about this as liquidity. If you have savings, business, personal savings, that's liquid, that's cash. And that's gonna be really, really important in considering you for a loan to evaluating that risk. Um, you're gonna to have to put some skin in the game to obtain a loan. And really depending upon the type of loan uh, is gonna require how much liquidity. So think about it in terms of uh, a house. When you guys applied, if you've applied for a home loan, at some point you're going to have to put something down. Even the government back programs require three to five percent down. So you're going to have to have some skin in the game. Same with commercial and business and SBA lending. You're going to have to have some skin in the game. We're going to evaluate that liquidity. We're going to ask for some back uh, bank statements, etc. But here's the thing: to the degree you're able to put uh, a limit amount down and you have cash reserves or that liquidity in reserves, we like that. It's important to really be transparent with your banker, show them all the ways that you have savings, personal business, CDs, et cetera, et cetera. Don't hide anything from that financial statement because we can do the best job for you if we understand your liquidity position. Uh, and it's strictly confidential. So that's why it's very important. Even if you have cash, a lot of my customers do have cash. Um, in a strong box or safe at home, dis disclose that so we have a full picture of your all of your liquidity. Next is collateral. Um, I, I often get asked, why can't you approve the loan? You have my house as collateral. <laughs> and while that makes a lot of sense from a common sense standpoint, you have to understand the job or the role of a lending institution. The role of, and a job of a lending institution is not to have collateral. We want to have our, our loans repaid. We're not in the business of seizing collateral and selling it. So it is a consideration. It is going to be required for most loans, collateral of some sort, but it is only one factor in making the determination to approve uh, a, a loan applicant. Okay, we're going to evaluate the risk and then consider what collateral we can use to minimize uh, that risk. OK, 
Okay, and that's really what lending is. It's just about risk mitigation. But as a good loan officer, I'm going to understand your needs, and I'm going to try to help uh, partner in such a way that we can minimize the bank's risk and also give you what you need. Okay. So, um, in many cases, the the loan in which you are applying is going to be the collateral. I'm buying a car. The car is the collateral. I'm buying a home. Home is the collateral. Okay, but if it's something for your business and it's not necessarily to buy real estate, um, I have a, a a loan. I have a loan need. It's going to be for short term uh, cash flow because I have a seasonality in my business. We are ramping up for this. Uh, fall and, and holiday spending, I'm going to have to go crazy buying. I'm going to inventory that merchandise and I'm going to sell it. So that's not going to be uh, the collateral that we see, which is the merchandise you're selling, because we know that's going to stay on the books, hopefully not for very long. So we're going to look for alternative ways to collateralize that loan that makes good sense for us. Okay. And then finally, conditions. Um, conditions might include things like the economic condition that we're all in right now. There's been a lot of uncertainty uh, of businesses. Uh, historically, these businesses have done certainly really well, but then all of a sudden COVID has hit. So we have to look at that from a condition standpoint and say, how do we mitigate that risk? Um, pending legislation, you know, uh, if, if you're considering starting up an e-cigarette business, we'd have to look at the pending legislation and saying, okay, what, what's the likelihood of that uh, business having some uh, challenges legislatively down the road? So those are the other conditions we consider, again, just trying to minimize risk. Uh, if you're asking for a, a line of credit, um, we're going to say, what's that for? Uh, and, and that's important for us to know so we can match the type of the loan with the type of the request. So that's those are basically um, the, some of the major tools that lenders use to evaluate credit. And I hope I didn't go into too much detail with you, but I thought that that's a really good uh, foundational place to start. And I'm going to just pause here if there's been any questions that have popped up. And so I can take a drink of water. Hey there, Mike. Thank you. Um, we've had a couple people saying, yes, they want the pro tips. Um, one of the questions, an issue I have come across frequently is husband and wife are 50-50 or 49-51% owners. One has low credit and a bankruptcy three to five years ago, um, and the other one doesn't, but they're both owners on a business. Can you push your Great on question. Um, in, in some aspects, if, if it's, I'm going to speak generally to uh, auto and maybe residential homes, they're going to use the average of those two. Um, but on the commercial side, we're going to look at that. And remember, we don't have a minimum credit score. I've done a lot of loans for clients over the years that have had past bankruptcies. As long as we have a reasonable explanation about that past bankruptcy, it's been discharged. Uh, there's good active paid credit now. We are certainly willing to look at that. So it's not going to preclude you from getting a loan because one has stronger credit than the other. Okay, and I'm happy to do a follow-up uh, question offline with that person specifically. Um, Thank you. We do, have, we do have the pro tips uh, that we can pass out if you guys would like that. Just put a note in the box. Okay. Thank you. So, next slide. You think you need a, a loan or you'd like to consider a loan for your business? And I've kind of placed these in a couple of three different buckets. Again, those who are considering starting up for business, I'm going to touch briefly there. We're going to talk about people who are in business existing right now, and they're going to grow their business, or they'd like to grow their business. And finally, people who are buying, or maybe people on the call considering selling their business. So there's three different ways we can help you, um, particularly if, if you're dealing with a preferred SBA lender. We just have more tools and products in our um, tool chest to help you with. Startups. You have a dream. I got, I got, I got a lot of respect for you as entrepreneurs. I really, really do. And I would love to help you along with the SBDC to put that dream, that vision on paper. That's one of the most important things to do. Get that dream from here on paper. And then over time, we're going to tweak that. We're going to work on it. And at some point, you're going to want to, uh, a loan. So a uh, good way to get that loan is through an SBA preferred lender. 
the SBA was created in the 1950s to partner with banks to help uh, them take more risk. Because you remember, historically, before the SBA was formed, uh, banks wouldn't take risk on, on new ventures. Or if they did, they had heavy losses because new business represent a lot more risk than an existing, existing business. So around the 1950s, the SBA was created. They said, we're going to partner with these member banks to allow them to take more risk uh, because it's a good thing for the economy. Okay, The SBA and Pineland Bank, we've been partnered up since the 1970s, so we've been doing it so long that we've, we've earned preferred lender status. That means we don't have to ask SBA's permission. We can just go ahead and underwrite that loan in-house and issue the loan. Uh, another way that startups are able to uh, fund historically through savings. Maybe they have family members who will invest in them or, or lend them money. Maybe it's through a 401k. Uh, if you are in business currently and you're growing, then a typical uh, business owner might uh, come to apply for a commercial loan. Uh, they might self-fund, um, you know, which is the way a lot of businesses grow, but if they're growing really fast, they don't have the capital to self-fund. Or they could seek uh, help with an SBA preferred lender. There's a lot of options for those existing businesses as well. Finally, if you're buying a business, you can uh, ask the seller if they're willing to hold paper. So the seller may finance that business uh, in which you're buying, for what you're buying. Or you, again, you could seek help with an SBA preferred lender. We can help you there as well. Next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, talking to the folks that are starting up a business. And some of you guys are in existing businesses because you have an entrepreneurial spirit, you will wanna start another business. And I hope you do, because uh, that's, that's how it's uh, happened to me. I've seen that in, in quite a many cases. So again, I can't emphasize enough. When I started my own consulting company and went out on my own, I went to SBDC at UNF in Jacksonville and I asked for their help to write a business plan. Not because I needed a loan from a bank, because I knew there was a lot of components to running a business that I wasn't fully prepared to execute. So it helped me identify those places where I needed more help and maybe some third party help, some professionals, but it really helped me focus on who my target audience was, who my geographical uh, range, where my customers were, who was I was gonna target. Uh, why would those customers um, borrow for, or buy from me, uh, who's my competition, et cetera. That's where the SBA, SBDC can really help. And a good banker will partner with the SBDC rep like Jody to, to really uh, bring a team in to help that person. You're gonna submit financial projections along with the business plan that are gonna show at least the first 12 months in great detail, anticipated revenues from all different sources, and anticipating expenses. And so you're gonna create a month to month cash flow. And that cash flow is either gonna show you in the black or in the red at the end of every month. And we're gonna to try to help mitigate that, uh, that red and try to get you into a positive earnings territory uh, with realistic sales and not forgetting any expenses. So some things to consider, who's gonna make up your team? Uh, I would certainly have somebody who's a, a, a veteran uh, financial person, somebody who's a, a, a lender. They have a lot of experience. They can talk about a lot of different ways you can borrow. I'd certainly have an accountant, a legal person. I'd certainly, uh, SBDC would be at the top of that list. You may have somebody uh, in-house that can do marketing, or you might hire that out. There's a lot of different aspects to running a business, and uh, I would... There have been occasionally people that I've met that have all those skills, but it's pretty rare, nor do they necessarily want to spend every hour of every day doing those things. So having a good team and building that team early is really, really important, whether they're co-owners or just partners uh, in this venture. Um, and I would say, you know, one of the things uh, that I look for is somebody who's really committed to it. Um, and it doesn't have to be that you're interested in the loan right now. I once worked with a client here with uh, Ms. Henson 
who was uh, interested in starting a business. She was a stylist and uh, she'd been working for somebody else and she had the dream of opening up her own salon. She wasn't quite ready at that point to open. She needed to work on her credit. She had to save her down payment. But over time, she tweaked that business plan and worked with it. And about two or three years later, um, we collectively finally had her ready to launch and she launched very successfully. So I'd say be responsive to uh, the, the, your partners and have that back and forth and keep it going so we can help you. Uh, and adjust that plan as needed. You're gonna, if you, if you start out with a written plan, you're gonna see where that written plan evolves over time. Uh, and again, if you have it in your head, it's just not as organized and having it on paper. But again, great tools and resources from the SBDC. They've got great templates. Um, that, that would be my recommendation. I'm a, I'm a firsthand um, client because that's how I did it. Uh, back in 2008. Hey, Mike, can I just jump in here for one quick second? Yes, this please. is Jody. You know, so many folks in this um, on this webinar indicated that they were interested in growing their business. And sometimes businesses start without a business plan, and, and we all know that that happens. It's certainly not against the law. But one of the things that um, you can do, even if you've already started your business, is either one, update your business plan or sit down with us at the SBDC and your banker and work on creating that business plan. When you walk into your banker's office and show them an updated plan or a new plan, which shows them that you really put the hard work and thought into how you're going to make that business successful, I'm guessing, Mike, that that goes a long way towards you in helping that that client and that small business owner get what they want to accomplish. So don't don't hesitate, even if you're just trying to grow your business. You don't have to be a brand new business to write that plan. But I would imagine a banker would be thrilled to see someone who hadn't had a previous plan sit down with them and talk talk through it with you. And you're going to tell them the things that you're looking for in that plan in order for you can for you to help lend them money. That's an ex excellent, excellent point. Um, it may not be a, a plan for the startup, but it might be your growth plan. Nothing wrong with writing a growth plan uh, and then present that because most of the time uh, when you when you're in a growth mode, um, everything again is up here putting it down on paper, reviewing it with other people and getting their input, circling back to what it really is you need to borrow or do you need to borrow and how you need to borrow, how much when. You don't want to go into too much debt right away, so maybe you could stagger that borrowing need over time as you grow. So those are all great points and, and uh, I highly recommend doing that. Okay, next slide please. So majority of you guys uh, here on the call today are in existing businesses and you're considering maybe borrowing or you, you're growing. So how do I grow? Okay. You're having growing pains of some sort. And usually that manifests in not enough space where you currently are. Maybe you're leasing. Uh, maybe you can expand into the space next door. Maybe you need warehouse space and you don't currently have it. That's a very common growing pain that I see. Maybe you're having cash flow growing pains where your payroll is now through the roof because your jobs are just at this peak and you're waiting on these, these jobs to pay. So it's a cash flow kind of growing pain. Maybe you don't have enough equipment to continue expanding, but there's some sort of growing pain. And um, it's a good thing. It really is a good thing, but it's uh, really important to have a plan about how to attack that. And so, if you were a, an existing business, the way that traditionally we work for a commercial loan is that we look based on the last couple of three years of historical tax returns. Now, Mike, aren't P&Ls good enough? Mike, I, oh, here I can send you my P&Ls. Profit and loss statements um, are very, very important. For a banker, remember, we are federally regulated. We can't accept historical pro internally prepared financials, which are 
profit and loss statements. We cannot accept that uh, beyond uh, the last tax period. So if you filed your 2018-19 tax returns and you're on extension for 2020, I'm going to have to have those historical tax returns that you filed, but I'm also going to ask for internally prepared profit and loss statements. And that might be through a bookkeeper or a CPA, but we're going to have to have those. So not that they're excluded, not that they're ignored, but uh, the standard for federally regulated lenders like us are to get tax returns, okay? So uh, we're gonna look at the last couple of three years. Remember, we're gonna look at that debt service coverage ratio that we talked about to include the debts you have and the debt you're looking to do to see if that works. Um, we're gonna look at a global cash flow. So what does global mean? And I'm not sure a lot of people talk about this. Your banker may or may not have talked about that with you if you borrowed in the past for your business. But we're really going to look at not just what the business earns and expends, income and debt. We're going to look at the person or the people, uh, the principles of that business, whoever owns that business. We're going to look at their personal income and personal expenses. And we're going to look at any other companies that they own and that income and expense. That's what's called a global cash flow view. And that's really, really important because you could have a great company doing good over here, but you could have another company that you're involved with that's not doing so well that could bring that uh, that down, bring that debt service coverage ratio down. So we're gonna look at that global view. And it's important to have a banker that'll be transparent with you so you can understand how that works. Um, we're also gonna look at uh, matching the need uh, the client has with a product. So for instance, if you are, um, looking to buy equipment or looking to buy a commercial real estate, it's going to be on a term loan. So we're going to basically look at the life, uh, the life range of that uh, equipment or that real estate, and we're not going to give you a 25 years to pay on a copier. The life, the life of that copier is not 25 years, if that makes sense. So we're going to match the term with the, with the need there. And a lot of customers ask for lines of credit, maybe because um, that's an easy request, but we're going to say, what are you going to do with that money? Well, I'm going to buy some equipment and I'm going to use it for short-term cash flow needs. And da, 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 da. So what we might do is say, you ask for a hundred thousand dollar line of credit, but you really need 50,000 for equipment. We're going to separate those two and give you the 50,000 for equipment and give you the 50,000 for short-term working capital. And that's, how one would mitigate the risk and match the product with the need for the client. Because it's in really the client's best interest as well to do that. Uh, we're gonna look at down payment sources. And again, uh, be transparent with your lender. Uh, you know, talk about all your personal and business savings. Uh, you know, sometimes we need to get creative. And I'll give you a short example here. I was working with a, a client, uh, they're an accountant in St. Augustine and they were leasing, they had some growing pains, they were really expanding out, they didn't have the room in that complex to expand out and to lease more space, so there was a building around the corner they really wanted to purchase. And their lender said, I'm sorry, unfortunately, you're gonna have to have 15 or 20% down. It was a rather expensive building that need a lot of renovations, they didn't have that. As a last resort, I was put in touch with them, I looked at their personal financial statement and saw that they had some cash, but they also had some stocks, some equities that were not in the retirement portfolio. And I, I got together with a couple over the weekend and I said, right now you're investing in these equities. You know, that's an investment and that's a fine investment. I'm not here to discourage that or to discount that, but you can elect if it's up to you to move or diversify that investment from the stocks and equities into commercial real estate. And nobody had really talked to them about that option. And after a discussion, they said, you know, we are comfortable by taking some of that money out of the stock market, cashing it out, and then having it as a down payment. They were able to buy that building in St. Augustine where they now house 20 accountants and their business has grown to no end. They have some appreciation in the building, but sometimes it just takes that creative look uh, experience look to be able to find the down payment in some cases. So uh, that was a nice success. 
And then finally, we're going to match the term uh, and, and the rate to the risk. Um, the lowest risk for a lender is somebody's primary home. We all want to sleep under a covered roof uh, and air conditioning here in Florida. And that's going to give you the lowest rate. Okay. And as that risk goes up, the rate will go up. On the other end of the spectrum, from a secured house, owner occupied, your principal dwelling, is an unsecured loan. There is no collateral. It's only based on your signature that you're going to repay. So therefore, that risk carries the highest risk and the highest rate. And then every other risk is kind of in between. And again, a good banker is going to explain those to you and understand, you're going to understand why the rate they're proposing is the rate. Don't expect, I'm just going to be square with you here on the call, don't expect to go in for a commercial loan and get the same rate as you would experience on a residential home. Okay? They're apples and oranges. The average person stays in a home, what is it, five to seven years? Okay. Um, the, the interest rate risk for a bank or a mortgage company on a home is not very great beyond about, about five or seven years. So even though they're giving you a 3% fixed rate for 30 years, most lenders, most investors know that, that that person won't keep that loan the full term. In a business loan, if you're buying commercial real estate, you don't ever want to move. If you're in business with a sign up, you never want to move. And so banks don't want to take 30 year fixed interest rate risk for a business because that's going to uh, create too much of a strain on earnings for the bank. So they're going to reprice that loan every three to five years, okay, so that we can match the interest rate environment with the rate that we're offering to that borrower. I'm going to pause here for questions. Existing <clears throat> um, business loans. Um, yeah, there, there a down payment requirement for a commercial or an SBA loan? Oh, oh yeah, good question. Okay. <clears throat> the typical down payment requirement for a commercial loan is 15 to 20%. So if you're buying a building for a million dollars, you're going to put up between 150 to 200 thousand dollars. Then you're going to have to pay the closing costs out of pocket. Okay. On an SBA 7A loan, we're able to do 10% down on the total of the building, the closing costs, any re renovations, etc. So on that same transaction. The person would put in a hundred thousand uh, dollars maximum. Okay, so there are advantages uh, for SBA in terms of the of the down payment requirement. It's a great question, and that's for existing business owners and for startups. It's ten percent, usually across the board, with some exceptions. Awesome, thanks, Mike. Yep, you got it. Rolling on to the next slide. If you want to buy a business, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. This, uh, most of the people who are on the call are either uh, starting a business or growing their own business, but we do do loans for folks who are buying a business. Uh, what I'd ask them to get is the last three years of tax returns from the business that's selling. I always recommend hiring a business attorney to review that contract. Uh, consider who's going to run that business. Is it going to be you personally? You're going to manage somebody. Do you have that experience in that industry? Or are you going to hire the experience or retain the employees who are in that business? And again, writing a detailed business plan, even though you're buying an existing business, is a requirement. It's necessary because you're going to want to change things for that in that situation. Uh, again, you're able to use projections, um, and we're going to consider a lot of different uh, types of collateral. P&Ls, I'm just going to say it again. If the if the selling business want to give you P&Ls, take them, great, but get tax returns as well and have your banker review the tax returns that that business has submitted to the government. Okay. Final thoughts. Next slide. 
<clears throat> guys, you know, lenders are going to vary. Um, there's a lot of different lenders out there. I mean, you, you think about it. Um, there might be national banks that are uh, really promoting their home equity line of credit, you know, and they've got a great home equity line of credit. There might be other banks that just do great job in, in car loans. Uh, there might be some lenders who have minimum loan sizes. Many, many borrowers come to me and say, you know, my bank, I bank with this bank and they have a minimum loan size of half a million dollars. Can you help me? That's, that's why it's important to know that lenders are going to vary uh, about the, the types of loans they offer, uh, what those strengths are, uh, what, you know, what appetite that they have, for instance. Uh, you might have a situation where somebody um, finds out that, uh, gosh, I can't borrow any more money in hotels. I, I want to uh, buy, buy into a hotel or build a hotel. Different banks have different maximums on the type of collateral exposure they're going to have. So they might have already done all the hotel loans that they need or can handle right now. So those are all things that are very, very important. It's important to build a relationship with a banker. And really, I would say build it now versus when you're absolutely in need of that loan. Uh, to get that person, uh, to get their trust, to, to lean in, to have them make it key introductions. That's what I do for most of my clients is just make key introductions. Do you know this person? I think this person can help you. Have you thought about this? Oh, let me introduce you to them. That's, that's how people really succeed in business is by reaching out, particularly for professionals in the financial industry, because uh, we know those key players and we can introduce the, the entrepreneur, the growing business to those people who will help them succeed in many cases. Um, and experience matters. You know, I can't stress this enough. Um, you know, I've, I've helped many people who were denied by their bank or told, I'm sorry, they can't help. And it's just simply because that person behind the desk didn't have the experience. I would say, you know, there are creative solutions. I've touched on a couple uh, that can help mean the difference between approval and denial. Uh, there are some instances where the best solution for the client is to not give them a loan. And I'll tell them that. I had a chiropractor come in town many years ago, and they were interested in borrowing money for a build out. And I suggested a couple other things. And I said, I don't know that you necessarily need a loan to do a build out. Here's another solution. They took that advice and they didn't get into to, uh, debt immediately. And they built their practice and built their practice, and they're doing phenomenal. And I'll tell them straight if I think it's in their best interest to do the loan or not. Um, I'm really happy to say that uh, there was a tow truck company that was barely able to get the 10% down requirements, but they were. And not only have they been able to buy their own real estate uh, to do their towing business, but now they're doing uh, RV rentals, boat and RV storage out of that business. And they have so many different sources of income now because they saw the potential in that four acre tract here in Nassau County. Uh, and that again is, is with the help of the SBA, the SBDC, their experienced lender, we're able to show them those different sources of income for them really to be successful. So in conclusion, we did talk a little bit about some of the tools that bankers use. We talked about the various loan options that entrepreneurs will use and should consider when starting growing or buying a business. And then finally, we covered some uh, just things to consider when you're shopping for a loan. We've got some great pro tips uh, printed out for you. I'm going to pause right here and thank you again for the time and ask you if you have any questions. Thank you, Mike. There was one question, a very specific one, um, which I think uh, it's very helpful. Uh, okay, so bear with me. <laughs> Our business is in commercial construction, therefore we float 200 to $300,000 at any given time. Uh, when you do your taxes, we choose the cash value rather than accrual value, therefore we're not taxed on the money we haven't received. Our tax return will show a break even almost every year, uh, even though our accrual would show a huge gain. Would that be considered for loans? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, there are addbacks uh, that bankers will use, uh, depreciation and interest expense, and we'll evaluate that knowing the industry that they're in and the tax 
uh, considerations their accountants and suggestions they've made. And they're absolutely, the, the uh, question is absolutely valid and they would be considered for a loan, yes. Great, thank you. Okay, any other um, questions coming in? We'll give you guys a chance to type them up. We had quite a few people who want to reach out either to you, Jody, um, or, or follow up um, for for one on one consulting and maybe even bring you in, Mike. Um, let me go to the next uh, screen here for <clears throat> excuse me, Mike's contact information. If you're interested in reaching out to him, and like we mentioned, if you want to receive that pro tips form, um, just request it in the question box. Please send me the form, um, and we'll get it to you. Um, and then also, if you want to uh, work with Jody or one of our, our other qualified consultants to go over your um, business needs and, and want to um, consult with us, then there will be a, a link and information sent out in the follow-up email uh, that'll go out in about an hour. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions come in, so I don't know, Jody, if you had any other thoughts to share. Sorry about that, I was muted. Just to wrap up, uh, thank you so much, Mike, for covering all of this. One of the most uh, difficult and um, intimidating things is to go into a banker's office and, and ask for, for a loan. And a lot of times that's how we at the SBDC can assist because we can sort of get you prepared for what he's gonna ask. We've got this great pro tips um, sheet that will also help you, but it's also ways to help you see how you can actually scale that business and what the bank is going to need to know from you in order to move that loan application forward. One of the things that I always tell my clients is you want to work with a bank that is willing to have some dialogue. Don't know if it's always going to work out, but chances are if you get to know your banker, particularly over time, your odds of being able to secure the proper amount of funding in the proper loan structure is significantly higher. And sometimes you may not be ready, it may take you another six months or a year to plan, but that banker is going to tell you what it is you need to do in order to get there. And that to me is a sign of a very good banker and a very good partner. And so that's what I encourage all my clients to do. We touched about business plans um, for just a, a couple minutes. Again, if you need assistance with those plans, if you need some advice on those plans, you want templates, you want market research to go into that plan. Those are just a few of the things that we can do here at the SBDC to help you get that business to where you wanna take it. So remember, we're here at no cost to you and we're ready to assist in any way we can. If those um, on the call wanna reach out by all means, please do so. I think um, you've got the sbdc.unf.edu address there, um, you can call the 800 number. You can also look on our website. It provides location, my phone number and email addresses on there as well. By all means, please reach out uh, to me. I'm happy to assist in any way I can. So thank you again, Mike. I don't wanna take any more of the time. Thanks, Jim. Are we good, Allie? I think we're good to go. No more questions have come in, so I think we'll call it a day. Um, We'll be sending out the pro tips to those who asked. Thank you everybody for attending. Mike, thank you for your expertise. This has been very enlightening. I hope everybody um, found this presentation beneficial and uh, we'll see you guys at the next one. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, bye. Bye-bye.